tone right. It's time to get started here. So first I have to give you a warning. Because look at all that stuff I crammed into this. Uh, this happens to be the, the discipline I'm most interested in. So I could talk really fast and way over your heads. So please don't be shy about yelling at me to slow down or wave your hands and say, explain that again. It's all good. I know, I'm quite aware that I can just blaze through all this stuff. It's very, it's very exciting stuff. Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is developmental genetics. And uh, this is a little different than the stuff we've been talking about. So we've got a different set of questions that operate in the realm of developmental genetics. So we haven't thought about this stuff at all before. Go back to Mendel's pea plants. Oh yeah, ram versus wrinkled peas. But obviously the whole plant isn't round versus wrinkled. It's localized to just the peas, right? Why is that? So what are the different kinds of things that are going on to set up a whole elaborate complicated pea plant? Why does it make a stem? Why does it make roots? Why does it make a flower? Why does it make pea pods? That's the realm of developmental genetics. So as you can see here, we have a couple of big questions here. So how do different cells express different genes? You know that your skin is expressing a set of genes that is different from what's being expressed on your eyeball. You wouldn't want skin with the texture of eyeballs, right? Or vice versa. So how is that happening? Okay, so how is that happening? So how is that pattern also consistently controlled? How come our cells don't get mixed up and suddenly start expressing eyeballs on your fingertips? What's going on here to control that pattern? And then we also are going to see that another big question is you can't explain this with just an absolute clear certain gene is expressed. There's no such thing as an eye gene. Instead what's going to happen is that there is a complex of many genes that have to interact in order to generate an eye or skin or whatever tissue we're looking at. And in crude ways, you know one, one simple question is why don't I have fly eyes? Why don't I have big red compound eyes like your flies? Why don't you? Why don't the flies have eyes like us? We could also ask a really fundamental question. Which end is up? Why is my head here and not jutting out of my hip or on my knee? And look, look around the room, you've all got heads in the same places. How does that happen? Okay, again, we're going to say, because this is a genetics class, it's genes, obviously. Genes have to somehow be controlling this behavior. How does a gene on a chromosome specify where your head is? Oh, no. Oh, no, is right. <laughs> oh. Don't do this to me. Okay. Let's see. I have to get out of this. Yeah, so we're going, we're going to struggle with this stupid thing again, I can tell. Okay, come on, give me a number, 10917. <laughs> okay. Maybe it's a Wednesday thing. Nothing likes to work on Wednesdays. All right. So we want to know how we control these things. How are they consistently specified so that every human being in this room has a head in the right place, has two eyes and two ears, etc. And that's the domain of developmental genetics. Where does this all start? 
Oh, this is a very complicated slide. Uh, this is a guy named William Bateson, who back in 1894 wrote a book called In Materials for the Study of Variation. And he was asking this question. How do you know how many legs to build? How many arms to build? How do you know your head goes here? And of course you can't do these experiments on people, so he went looking in organisms. So, for example, one of the classic examples is this one, the case of the, and the modification of the antenna of the insect into a foot. Over here's an example. So there's a fly. There's a, there's a leg coming out where its antenna should be. There's the normal antennae. So we obviously have cases where things do go wrong. How does that happen? He focused on something in particular called homeosis. Homeosis is a really interesting phenomenon where one portion of the organism gets transformed into a different part. An antenna gets transformed into a leg. Or as we see up here, this is a fruit fly. Do you see what's different about it from the flies you've been looking at? No, that's what I look like. Oh, really? <laughs> You'll have to show me. Okay, I'll show you next time. <laughs> okay, yeah, anyway, you can see this has got two wings here, two wings there. Uh, normal wild type flies will just have this one pair of wings up here. Yeah, if you've been counting, if, if you've been collecting four winged flies, I really want to take a look. So, this again is a homeotic transformation. I noticed some of you the other day just happened to discover that there are halteres back here. There are these little, little lumpy things that stick out from the side. They're gyroscopic organs. In this case, those halteres get transformed into a wing. How does that happen? We want to know. Here's some other examples. You know, hey, it's some. Sometimes you get peculiar things in human beings too. So look at that hand. In some cases, where you get things like polydactyly, it's like there's a mirror image duplication of half of the hand. Oh man, how does that go on? So there's there's questions here. How does how do genes specify this? And notice he's doing this in 1894. So this is before Thomas Hunt Morgan, before Mendel was rediscovered. He's just observing these things and trying to figure out how it goes together. Yes? Would this be like the same phenomenon if somebody was like missing fingers? If they're born with a defect that causes yeah. an absence? Sometimes. Okay. Uh, there's a combination of things that are not genetic that can also induce that. I mean, for example, club foot mm -hmm. is not genetic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's caused by errors in development. So you've got, you got a careful game you've got to play here where you sort out, hey, is this genetic? Is it transmitted through a family line? Or is it just some random error in development? Okay, so he's looking into this. We've got this thing called homeosis we're interested in. It's clear that there are patterns in organisms. And a lot of people chose this familiar critter to work with, right? You think there's a reason you guys have been working with flies? It's because flies are such useful tools for this kind of thing. You can't do this with people. But with flies, you can do all kinds of terrible, horrible things to their genome and get interesting effects. So this is just an illustration of the fly life cycle, which you're already familiar with. Adult fly lays eggs. Eggs turn into embryos. These are embryos down here. You can see the embryos have kind of a segmented pattern to them. They eventually hatch out into little worm-like maggots. And those go through a couple of divisions, a couple of instars or they shed their external cuticle and get larger and larger. Then they pupate. You've all seen those. You look at the sides of your fly bottle and there's pupae all over the place. And then those eclose to form the adult fly after about nine to 10 days. So that's convenient. That's a, that's a good model to work with. We can do all kinds of manipulations here. And we'll talk about some of those. Here's an example of a 
kind of early manipulation. This was like in the 1950s, I'm thinking. Uh, in the 1950s, this guy, Klaus Sander, didn't have all the genetic tools that we do now. And so he was asking the same questions about pad information. Why do you get heads at one end and tails at the other end? And he was working with two organisms. He worked with Drosophila. Also this one called Euscalus, which is the leaf hopper. Some of you may have seen Euscalus before. They tend to make those little, those little spit nests where they just bubbles and spit. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Well, clearly you gotta get out of the prairie more. But anyway, uh, they're, they're cool little organisms. Just, just a little dipter. And you can do experiments with these. This is a classic experiment, his lig ligature experiments. So I said, okay, we start with our embryo here, which is supposed to develop into a segmented embryo that looks like this. That's what we are expecting to see happen. And we can number those segments, 1 through 14 here. What he did is, is tried to meddle in the formation of that pattern. And the way he did it was to take a fine hair and tie it around the egg and cinch it tight. So look at your experiment. This, this is tricky stuff. Apparently he used the hairs from the head of his grandchild because only little fine baby hairs are fine enough for this. I'm sorry people, you are too coarse. This stuff just won't do it. You gotta get the finest hairs possible. And you tie it around the egg. For instance, here he's tying it at stage five in development. So not the earliest stage, we let it develop just a little bit, then we tie it off this piece. And we ask what happens in the embryo as it develops. And what's shown here is just the numbers of the segments developed. So it makes segments one through six in the front part, it makes 13 through 14 back here. There's a gap. Where is segments seven through 12? They don't form. So apparently tying a knot around the middle of the fly's body interferes with the development of this middle, this middle range of segments. What gets interesting though is, okay, you, go, you let it develop a little longer before you tie it off. So you just let it grow a little longer and then you tie it off. So go from here to there, tie it off at stage five. And you look and you get, in the front part, you get segments one through nine, and then 10 through 14. Everything develops just fine. What's going on? The idea was, maybe there's a diffusible molecule. Maybe there's something that's spreading through the animal. If it's got a really low concentration, like at the back end, uh, you make the back end segments. If you get a high end concentration, you make the front end segments. And it takes time for it to spread through the embryo to form those intermediate segments. That's his interpretation of the gap that we're seeing forming in here. So he says, okay, we see some gaps. He also did other novel experiments. I don't know how he did this one but he tied a ligature around a euscalus egg lengthwise. I just, I don't want to try this one. This one's too hard. But anyway, he did, he tied it around here. And uh, then he noticed this is a really curious thing. You got duplications, you got twins. What's going on there? Well, again, he's maybe, maybe there is something diffusing from the middle that defines the orientation of the embryo. This was Sanders big thing. He called these morphogens, molecules that diffuse through the animal and have different concentrations in different parts of the animal. And that's how you'd specify the head end and the tail end. Head end has lots of morphogen. Tail end has only a little bit of morphogen. So you just have to find the gene for the morphogen. That would be the cool thing to do. Uh, Sander didn't have the tools to do that, but he postulated that, yeah, there are probably morphogens that are responsible for diffusing across the animal, 
And these are gene products that by their concentration specify the development of different tissues. Well, that's simple and elegant. He did other experiments. So this again is Euskalus. There's what it's supposed to look like as an embryo. And one of the cool things about Euskalus is it's an herbivore. It sucks plant sap. That's what it lives on, is biting into plants, sucking out the goo, and digesting that. And as you probably know, that's really hard for most animals to do. Yeah, we don't have the enzymes to break down cellulose, things like that. Uh, so what Euskalus has instead, right here, that little black dot, that is a little packet of bacteria that Mama, Mama Euskalus packs into her baby's eggs. So it's just sitting there waiting to be engulfed in the gut of the embryo, and then it's going to provide this this stockpile of bacteria that will help digest the foods it's going to eat. Uh, what Sander found nice about this is that's a handle. So you got your egg sitting there, and you pull out a nice little dental probe, and you reach up here, and you gently push on the embryo, and push and push, and you can slide that packet around. Oh, that's fun. So you can actually move it around inside the embryo. And at the same time, when you move it, it's dragging, dragging along some of the cytoplasm from around it. So what you see here is, okay, our ligature experiment first, without moving the, the little bacterial packet. And what you get is you get these, these distortions in which segments develop. And here's his model for why that happens. So you have a high concentration of something at the front end, and a low at the tail end, and you ligate it right there, it makes like a little dam. And the morphogen accumulates up here. So you get a higher concentration spread over a short distance. So you're gonna make front end structures there, you're, not, you're gonna make tail end structures here, and then you're gonna be missing stuff in the middle. What he was able to do with the transplantation, moving that little bacterial packet around, is like, look here, he's going to push the bacterial packet up this way, to right in the middle, and then he ties it off right behind there, and yes, what happens then? Well, when you look at the embryos that develop in there, you get an embryo up here in the front that's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got the whole range of tissues, so it's like a full embryo developing right there. And then back here, you get the posterior part, just the posterior part. Again, down here, here's how he explains this with his gradients. Oh yeah, we pushed this up there, we created a low concentration of morphogen right here in the middle, there's a high concentration at the front end, so it drops off rapidly, but this is the entire range just compressed into a shorter distance. He did all kinds of variants on this. So like this one, you, you sometimes when you push it up here, then you tie it off. Uh, this is a low concentration. This was initially back here at the low end. It's still low here, and it recon reconstitutes the gradient. So you get something like this. All kinds of fun and games that you can play with this. So again, a lot of this was done in the 1950s. So we had this extensive literature that said, hey, we think there are, there's a gradient here. We think there's some substance called that we're calling a morphogen that is responsible for diffusion in producing this range of phenotypes across the length of the animal. But he didn't know what it was. Didn't quite have the tools yet to do that. So we're going to have to do some other experiments to figure this out. And it's going to be work of these three people. Ed Lewis, Christiana nusslein Bullhard, and Eric Bischaus. Uh, Ed Lewis. Ed Lewis did a lot of the earlier work. He was working primarily in the 60s, but he lived a long time. He did a lot of other work. 
Uh, and what he was looking at are those homeotic mutations. So he was looking at things like four-winged fruit flies and doing crosses to try and puzzle out what was what, what kind of genes are involved in this, identifying potential genes that are responsible for specifying, hey, you've got a front wing here and you've got a halt here, here, but sometimes you can transform it into a hind wing. So a lot of classic genetics done by this guy. These two, Yanni Nusslein Volhard and Eric Bischaus, were partners in a massive research project. Really massive. This was in the 1980s. And I'll just tell you, I, I was a graduate student in the 1980s. And I heard about this experiment and read about, read about it while it was in progress. And I was sitting there in my little lab feeling incredibly inadequate because this was a daunting experiment they did. Just, I could not imagine doing this. I thought, is this what I have to do to get a PhD? Because it was an insane amount of work. So what were they doing? Well, let's talk about their experiment. Uh, what they did was, it was called a saturation mutagenesis experiment. So in this experiment, what they resolved to do is, okay, remember T.H. Morgan goes in, finds a white-eyed fly, starts doing crosses with it, find some other mutations, etc., etc. In this saturation mutagenesis experiment, Nusslein, Volhard, and Bischaus said instead, our goal is to induce a mutation with x-rays and with chemical mutagens in every single gene in the fly. That's why it's called saturation mutagenesis. Our goal is just to zap every single gene and see what the outcome was. As you can see, this is a fairly complex experiment. I've, I've been thinking for a long time, maybe we should try something similar to this in genetics. Uh, what this is, is their apparatus, where you get a bunch of test tubes, and you put the flies you want to cross in there. Again, this sounds familiar, right? I'm just going to take a couple of flies, throw them in a bottle and cross them. In this case, it's a test tube. And we take a whole bunch of these test tubes and we tie them together with rubber bands and we put the open mouth of the test tube over a petri plate which contains auger and it's a special auger. It's a yeasted apple juice auger plate. It's got apple juice mixed into the auger. I've worked with it before. It's messy. It's, it, if you think you get mold in your, in your bottles right now, imagine apple juice spread out. Anyway, you got to work fast, you got to throw in some some chemical fungicides in there and things like this, but then look how nice this is. At the mouth of every single one of these test tubes, there's a nice little collection of eggs that are laid that can then be hatched out. So you can look at lots and lots and lots of flies. Okay, this is preliminary results of that screen. Again, it was in the uh, 1980s. They have since gone way beyond this. Uh, they, they identified 139 genes with the first phase, but clearly there's many more genes than that in the flies. And I think there was a recent paper where they had screened a million flies. You can see why I say I was intimidated by this. Imagine if it came to my genetics class and I said, okay, we're going to count a million flies this semester. Yeah, you would think spread it out over a couple of years, but hey, you're smart. You can do it, right? No? No? Okay. Non-stop work is what it involved. So every day they were doing this. They were coming in every day, pulling off one of these Petri dishes, or a couple of these Petri dishes with new flies in them, and uh, studying their development, looking at the embryos and asking what was happening with the embryos. There's a couple of things they were trying to do here. Again, thinking back to Thomas Hunt Morgan, he's just looking at adults. He's got the easy thing, right? Got white eyes versus red eyes. Hey, that's easy to see. Uh, Nusslein, Volhard, and Bischhaus 
are looking at embryos. So these tiny little dots on the on the auger plate, and they're trying to look for little differences in embryonic development early on. As you can see here, they send up about 27,000 lines of flies. They found 18,000 lethal mutations. They actually were looking for lethal mutation, mutations. Lethal mutations are great. They don't make it to adulthood, but you're looking at embryos. So you just look for things going wrong in embryos and ask, what happened there? So they found lots of lethal mutations. They found specific mutations causing embryonic lethality. So they're able to watch these embryos and they see over and over again, it develops for a day or so and then poof, it's dead. And it seems to be similar causes each time. They also found mutations that caused embryonic phenotypes, besides just dying. Okay, dying is interesting, but they also found changes in the phenotypes. And, hey, you know what this word means, complementation groups. They identified 139 complementation groups. So they've identified roughly 139 genes that are active in early development and that are important for the normal development of the fly. Okay, once again, it was a matter of coming in every day and looking at all these flies, these fly embryos. This is what the fly embryos look like. And uh, what the, you, you can see the differences, right? So some of these look, this looks fairly wild type down here, but it's got some things wrong with it. Look at these others. They're all different. So what are you doing? You're screening for all these variations in early embryonic development, which in these cases are all going to die. But you still got you still got the parents in the test tube, right? So you can go back to those and work with those to try and tra track back the gene, figure out what's going on. Okay, so yeah, again, this is why I was kind of intimidated you got to really know your flies. you got to be a master of fly embryology to be able to recognize what's going on with all of these variations. And they did. Okay, one of the early distinctions they were making is, and we talked about this last time, right? Maternal mutations. So what we're looking at here is maternal mutants versus zygotic mutants. So maternal mutants are going to rely on the expression of specific genes in mom, but not necessarily in the embryo itself. And zygotic genes are expressed in the embryo. So those are mutations that the embryo carries that are expressed in its embryonic development and can disrupt that development. So what you see here is a summary of some complicated experiments. So, uh, like it says here, we can distinguish all embryos from females that are homozygous mutant from maternally active genes. So here's our mother, and she's homozygous mutant for a gene that's important in early development. And we cross that to a wild-type male. The wild-type male cannot rescue it. All of the eggs produced are going to fail in early development. And that sort of makes sense. So mom could not put the necessary components in the developing embryos, so they just fail and die. So 100% death. Here over here we do a, a reversal of that experiment. Here's the, the father fly. He's the one that's mutant. Again, these are genes that are expressed only in early development. So you're going to have a homozygous adult, and they're fine, even though they lack this essential gene. Okay, so that's what's going on here. And we cross that to a wild-type female, and we get 100% survival. Everyone's good. Of course, these are all heterozygotes for that particular trait, uh, but they survive just fine. 
because mom had the necessary genes to support the early development of the egg. That's different from the zygotic mutants. This, this is typical for a Mendelian cross, right? So you've got a heterozygote. So two heterozygotes, we cross those for their heterozygotes for a single locus. And what you expect to have happen is you get a three to one ratio, right? So there's a couple of heterozygotes, there's a wild type, here's our homozygotic mutant, and that dies. You get a three to one ratio in those cases. All makes perfect sense, right? Except you did one cross like this, and Johnny Nusslein Bullhard and Gary Grishaus did hundreds of thousands. Like I said, I think they're up to a million right now. I got out of the zebrafish game just in time because shortly after I graduated, Yanni Nusling Bullhard came to visit the lab I was in in Oregon. And they have since done the same sort of saturation mutagenesis experiment in zebrafish. It's become a really common tool. Just get in there and zap everything and then sort through them, try and puzzle out what genes are affecting early development. One of the results of this saturation mutagenesis experiment is this. They identified a gene they called bicoid. This is a photograph of the early fly egg, and it's been stained. It's got an in situ stain for messenger RNA for bicoid, and there it is. It's localized to the front end. We talked about this last time, right? So we got this bicoid gene. It's expressed at the front end. Bicoid is essential for defining the anterior end of the fly. So that's one of the problems. We'll talk about a couple of other products of this saturation mutagenesis screen in a moment. So, as I told you before, this is how Bitcoin works. You look in the ovarian follicle of the fly, and there are a bunch of nurse cells that are busy producing the bicoid RNA and pumping it into the egg where it adheres to the front end of the egg. There are cytoplasmic proteins that localize it to that place. And then when it's laid as an egg, you find, okay, we got RNA right there. Uh, the animal is gonna go through a series of cell divisions to form a blastoderm. That just means this is now multiple cells in here and you find the bicoid RNA localized up there. So that's kind of essential, right? That's, that's our candidate for Sanders morphogen. Maybe this is the molecule Klaus Sander was playing with in all of his ligature experiments and his transplantation experiments, all this cool stuff that he was doing. But now we've, we've identified a specific gene that carries out this action. More games with Bitcoin. We can do all kinds of fun things with Bitcoin. So what you see here, uh, this little red line here, that marks something called the head fold. That when the fruit fly is developing, it's going to make all these little segmental bits like this. And the there's an anterior one that marks the position of the larval head. So this is this is all head up here. This is thorax and abdomen. If you look at a wild type fly and you look at the larva, this is what you see, that this head fold forms at about the 65% of the wave position. So 65% here, 35% up here. That's, that's where you're supposed to make that. So it's gonna affect the proportion of the embryo that gets made into mouth parts and things like that. If you have a heterozygote for bicoid minus, as we got here, they've got half as much bicoid. Makes sense, right? Normal diploid fly is gonna have two copies of bicoid, and when it expresses those two copies of bicoid, you get a head forming right there. 
if you're a heterozygote and you're missing one, you got less bitcoin. So the head shifts position anteriorly to the 73% mark. We can also do fun things like induce duplications and get animals with four doses of bitcoin or six doses of bitcoin. Look, it just neatly shifts right back. Again, this is what we expect of a morphogen. So you're playing with the concentration, you're playing with the dosage. And higher dose means head end, low dose means tail end. And here we genetically tweak that. And we can get more and more of the animal making the head. And you might say, well, did we get any big headed flies buzzing around out of this? And no, you don't. Because it regulates. What happens is, yeah, in the larva, it's going to contribute more to the anterior end of the larva, but then through larval development, and uh, it will shift again. And by the time we reach adulthood, we get back to a normal sized head. Too bad, huh? It'd be fun to play with that. Anyway, so we got this pattern that we can observe. Here's another thing we can do an experiment. So we've got our wild type larva right here, and our wild type em embryo right here, and a donor. So we got our wild type larva, it's supposed to look like this. If you are, have bicoid minus, if you're mutant for both copies of bicoid, you look like this. And you can see, okay, there's kind of a mirror image here, isn't there? So this is the posterior part, there's posterior and posterior. Uh, this is the spiracle, which is in the posterior part. There's a spiracle and a spiracle. So we don't form a head. We form a fly with two butts. Okay, what we can do though is an experiment where we take a wild type embryo and we get a very fine pipette and we puncture, puncture that wild type and slurp out some of the cytoplasm from up here. And then we inject it as close to the front end of a mutant animal as we can get. And we get partial rescue. So this should have become like that. Instead, we get partial rescue. It starts to form a head with those are mouth parts there. It's got some orientation. There's no spiracle here. It's not perfect, however, because it's really hard to get the dosage just right. You're taking, you're taking a random sample of Bitcoin plus cytoplasm from a wild type animal and putting it in the mutant. And you can never get it exactly this, the right amount with this kind of crude technique. But yeah, you do get a partial rescue. And of course, because scientists are scientists, you also got to do this experiment where you suck out some of that bicoid positive cytoplasm. And instead of trying to put it in the front end of the animal, you put it in the middle of the animal, right there. And what happens? Well, you get a, a fly larva that tries to develop a head right in the middle of its body. So it's got mouth parts there. And it's still got two butts. Yeah, so we can we can play all kinds of games there, but it is suggesting that hey, there is there is a gradient of a molecule, and that molecule is bicoid that determines whether your front end is the front end or your, your tail end is the tail end. They didn't stop there though. Okay, we've got we've got bicoid, and bicoid forms this nice gradient. And seems to be important in specifying front and back. But remember, they were screening thousands and thousands and thousands of mutants. And they found other mutants. And among those mutants, they found a class of mutations called the gap mutants. They are defects in the gap genes. Oh, so these are zygotic genes. These are not maternal. They're turned on in the fly embryo. And they turn on in relatively broad regions. You don't have anything quite as broad as Bitcoin, which is in a gradient from front to back. But for instance, here is giant 
It's got two broad stripes. Here's Krupal. It's got a large stripe in the middle. Here's Knurps. It's got a chunk in the front and another one in the middle. Here's Tailless with a chunk in the back and another one sort of front middle. And together, when you look at all of these, you see they nicely bracket each other. So we're dividing our embryo into multiple components. We got hunchback, which is in the front, and looks a lot like bitcoid, so it's covering the front half of the animal. Uh, and then we got things like uh, tailless, which has got a big chunk in the back. Also, this little piece right there is complicated or giant, which has two stripes. And between those, they specify the full range of information for the specifying the length of the animal. It's not as simple as a gradient, is it? So now we got these gap genes, which basically specify chunks. They say, okay, this is, this is your head, and this is your neck, and this is your chest, this is your abdomen. Kind of like that. So, and if you don't have these particular genes, you get a gap in the formation of the embryo. And this is actually a callback to Klaus Sander, who was talking about gaps with his ligation experiments. So we're, we got these genes. So it's like there's a little hierarchy here. First, you got bicoid, which is maternal, and specifies the broadest possible definition. It says your front or your back. And then we got these gap genes that switch on after that. And they specify, hey, you're this, you're this particular region along the length of the animal. So we're, we're gradually assembling all the information we need. Now, we can do experiments here, too. So what do we see here on the, here on the left? This is bicoid expression, and we're doing the same thing I showed you earlier. So no bicoid, or one dose, or two doses, this is the wild type condition, or four or six. In addition, what we're going to do is throw in a reporter gene. So this is a reporter. It consists of a promoter up here and a Tata box. A lot of you are in molecular genetics or have taken, or taken molecular biology, right? You know what this is. So it's, it's just a little short fragment that's got the, the promoter for hunchback. So not the whole hunchback gene, just, just the reporter. And we tie that to a LACZ marker so we can stain that. We can, we can stain and see wherever hunchback is supposed to be turned on. Okay, so that's what we're seeing over here on the right. So we're doing these different doses of bicoid, and then we look at where hunchback is expressed. If, if it's bicoid negative, if there's no bicoid at all, hunchback doesn't turn on. Remember, hunchback is zygotic. So this is telling us that somehow bicoid is activating hunchback but only at the highest concentrations of Bitcoin. And then as we modify the concentration of Bitcoin, in each case, hunchback extends a little farther back, a little farther back, a little farther back. So this is telling us that there's an interaction going on here. Bitcoin is on, in a nice gradient, and that gradient is responsible for switching on another gene a gap gene, in this case, hunchback. Beginning to get an idea what the story is here, there's a whole series of genes that are, have to be turned on, and which ones are turned on specifies which region of the animal you're in. We can do this as well with another gene. This is Krupal. Right? Krupal's got the stripes in the middle. So there's Krupal. And what we can do is play with hunchback now. So in this case, we have activated hunchback. 
This, so this is the wild type concentration from anterior to posterior. And so in the front, you find lots of hunchback because Bitcoin has turned it on. And then there's a gradient where it drops off to nothing in the posterior region. And what we find is that there's a narrow range right in here, which turns on Krupal. So if you have lots of hunchback, Krupal is turned off. If you have no hunchback, Krupal is turned off. If hunchback is just right, you switch on Krupal. And again, we can do experiments. So here's an experiment uh, where we modify hunchback. So we're not, we're not going to turn on much of hunchback. We only turn on a little bit. And we just get it to the activation level. So we don't get so high that it can suppress Krupal, but we do get it high enough so it can switch on Krupal, and then we see Krupal spreads out anteriorly. Again, classic developmental genetics is you start playing with separate genes and you see how they work with each other to define patterns of expression. All right, so Nusselin uh, Wolhardt and Bischhaus did all these experiments and isolated all these mutations and identified all these genes that are responsible for early development. And they were actually able to put it together into a lovely little hierarchy. So early on, we have maternal genes, like Bitcoin. There are other maternal genes that I'm not going to talk about in this class, but they're things that they define left and right, dorsal and ventral. So there's a whole catalog of maternal genes that do this. We're just looking at the anterior posterior axis. So here's bicoid turned on in the anterior part of the animal. And then you have next in succession the gap genes. And they just show hunchback here. But all the other uh, gap genes are following along. They're reading each other's concentration. They're looking at the concentration of bicoid. And that determines where, what region the gap genes will be turned on. And then there was a mind-blowing result, not expected at all. The next layer are called the pair rule genes. And the pair rule genes are pretty cool. They make stripes, you know, these circumferential stripes. But they alternate segments. So this, one of these is turned on in segment one, and then it's turned on in segment three, and then segment five, segment seven, segment nine, etc. And there's another one that's turned on in segment two, segment four, segment six. You get the idea. So you get this, this lovely Easter egg look, where you got pairs of stripes. This was totally unexpected. Nobody thought we'd see this. But there they are. We have to figure out what's going on here. And once the pair rule genes are expressed, that sets up all the segments. Remember 14 segments in the fly? So we're going to have, uh, have uh, s seven of each of these colors, and they're going to alternate, and between them they turn on the full 14 segments of the fly. So we make our segments here. This name's a few of them. Select one is called even skipped. That makes sense, right? You got a pair rule gene that skips the even segments. It's expressed in all the others. There's also one called odd skipped. That makes sense. This one is called Fushitoratsu, which is Japanese for too few segments. So we've got a lot of, lot of genes like this. There's a whole bunch of pair rule genes, not just two, there's a bunch of them. Once we form the segments, then there's another level that comes into action, and these are the segment polarity genes. So we set our turn on the parallel genes and we turn on alternate segments, and we form all 14 segments. And then in those segments, another set of genes come, gets turned on, the segment polarity genes. For instance, engrailed is one of the best known. And engrailed gets turned on in every segment, not every other segment, every segment and it's just expressed in the front end of the segment. Okay. So this is why they're called segment polarity, 
It's like, okay, we've set up segments, we've made nice stripes, but we've forgotten which end is the front again. So we're going to turn on another gene that's going to help orient that particular segment. And then finally, after we get, we get all these segments, they're all marked out, they all got their patterns of gene expression, uh, finally we turn on a set of genes called the selector genes. And the selector genes are going to specify what needs to be made in each segment. So for instance, there is a, an abdominal selector gene. Okay, notice it doesn't necessarily respect the boundaries of the, of the segments. It's just going to say, okay, this portion of the animal is the abdomen, and this portion over here is the thorax, and this is the head. Uh, we'll get to those in a minute. Maybe. If not, we'll get to them Monday. Uh, the selector genes have another gene name that are called the Hox genes, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. But we'll talk a little bit more about those. Okay, so we got this nice hierarchy that specifies all the bits and pieces of the embryo. Let's talk a little bit about these pair row genes. So like you said, they're activated in alternating segments. These genes define stripes of activity that are slightly offset from one another. I'll show you a diagram to illustrate that. And if you have a mutation in a pair row gene, if you knock out a pair row gene, what you get is an embryo that's only got half as many segments. You get the full range, you get from head to abdomen, but it's made up of half as many segments. There are other distortions that occur too. So here, for example, is a couple of these genes. So this is even skipped and Fushi Teratsu. And I think you can see some, there's blue and there's reddish brown staining. Uh, this is that Easter egg look you can get with pair of genes. So we're going to express those all the way over there. And these turn out to have complicated patterns of expression as well. I know this is kind of a murky, murky slide. Let me step back a little bit and see if I can puzzle it out. Anyway, what we're doing here is we're staining for even skipped. Remember, which is just supposed to be every other segment. Like what you see here, there is a stripe, there's a stripe, there's a stripe, there's a stripe. Uh, when you look at look at the expression over time. It's a heck of a lot more complicated. It starts out with a broad fuzzy stripe here. That broad fuzzy stripe gets a little darker. A fainter stripe appears. You get the idea. It's not like boom all at once. You got seven stripes. This is going to progress developmentally. Why is it doing this? It's because these genes are all busy interacting with each other that the final stripe pattern isn't established instantly, it's established by the genes all talking to one another to set up the pattern. So here, for example, uh, this is a, another kind of experiment. They are once again doing that trick where you just pull up the promoter, attach it to a marker, and you can do things like then figure out what regions of the promoter do, do which part of the pattern of expression. And what we're seeing here is that there's a region of the promoter for Eve that is specific for stripe two. Remember, there's seven stripes. Turns out that each of those stripes has its own little promoter region that controls how it's expressed. So there's Eve strike 2. This is the normal pattern up here. So we see a high concentration of this Eve strike 2 right here at the third pair segment. Don't worry about that. The segments versus pair segments. Get into advanced developmental biology and Drosophila. We can talk about that. We'll just ignore him. See, that's a segment. Okay, so there's Eve strike 2. It's turned on in segment 3. And then over here, this is giant. It's got this pattern of expression. And over here is hunchback. Looks like that. And there's Krupal. And there's, there, of course, is also Bigquake. So you look at this pattern of expression, 
Can you make any hypotheses about how strike two is regulated? How do these other genes affect strike two? Go ahead, throw out an idea. What do you think the effect of giant is on the Eve strike? Does it activate the strike or suppress it? It's, yeah, it looks kind of like, hey, E strike 2 just starts up right where the giant strike ends. So maybe one hypothesis is giant suppresses E strike 2. And uh, similarly, what do you think Krupal does? How does Krupal affect the expression of Eve? You just got some inspiration from what Giant does. What do you think Krupal does? Yeah. Isn't that cute how the Eve strike 2 just happens to appear in this little gap between Giant and Krupal. And you might also further speculate that maybe, hey, maybe Hunchback turns on the strike too, so it's right there. So that's how we get that stripe, is all those earlier gap genes are interacting to specify it. So Hunchback says, make a stripe, just make a stripe anywhere in here. And then Giant and Krupal fine tune it and say, no, this strike is only going to be in this little gap right here, which is kind of a cute idea. Can you think of a way to test that hypothesis? You're working in a lab that's got thousands of mutants, but they've knocked out the various gap genes and the pair root genes and all that kind of stuff. How do you think you can test that hypothesis? Yeah. You would knock out Giant and Krupal and see if the yeah. Eve strike is growing. So if we knock out Giant, what would happen to the Eve strike? I think it would stretch out this way towards the Yeah. If we knocked out Krupal, it would spread out that way. These are predictions for an experiment we could do in the lab. And they did them. Okay, first I'll just mention. Uh, a little molecular biology for those of you in molecular biology. They have dissected these promoter regions and the uh, activator regions of, of these genes all up the wazoo, and they are complicated. So what you see here is we got Bitcoin, which is activating here, and here's Hunchback. It's got an activator there. We got a giant Krupal that are repressors that are scattered along here. It's, it's a mess. But let's do the experiment you just suggested. Uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to we're going to build some some probes, some markers. So here, for instance, we find okay, there's a little piece of the promoter that we can pluck out and attach to lag Z, and we can see oh, that's that piece of the promoter turns it on in strike one. Then we can pull off another one. Here's this one's for strike six. There it is. Uh, here's one for stripe seven. We can essentially dissect the regulation of this gene to a fine degree of detail and ask where things are getting turned on. Okay. Then we can do the experiment. We've got markers for these things. And we are out of time. So let's resume here on Monday, and I? You can, I think you can see just looking at this that the experiment works. And we'll talk more about that on the Monday in a second. How are these particular genes affected? Okay, any questions? Everybody knows what they're doing in the lab, right? Just counting, counting, counting.